Hi, I'm Per Alberg. I'm the discoverer of Elgin Herpeton, and I would like to take the opportunity to tell you a little about this animal, about the discovery, uh, and about its significance. The whole story begins in the 1830s with the discovery of some strange fossil bones and scales of fishes uh, in a small sandstone cliff uh, at a site called Scat Craig near Fogwatt on the Baron of Linkwood uh, at the place you see marked on the map here. Uh, this is a, a Google Maps view of the actual fossil locality. It's not easy to see anything very much. Fortunately, I know it well because I've been there. Um, and here's a key, uh, that little dark strip of water is the Bone of Linkwood. Uh, and peeking out in places here along the bank, you have a sandstone from what we would call the late Devonian period. It's about 375 million years old. Now, most of what we know about the early work of this locality uh, comes from the uh, account written by Patrick Duff, whom you see here. He was the town clerk of Elgin, um, and he had uh, a major role in the early study of the fossils from this locality, as well as just recording the, the history of the excavations. But I want to tell you a little bit about this time period, the late Devonian, 375 million years ago. What can we say about such a very distant time? Well, the world looked really different. This is a pretty reliable global map of this period, and I dare say you won't really recognise anything at all, although if you look carefully at the outlines here, you can see contours of some of the modern continents here. For example, we have India wedged in. The um, star here represents the locality of Scat Craig. It's in the sort of southern highlands of um, a largish continent that straddles the equator. And this continent consists of North America over here, Greenland wedged into the top, and Europe over here. So there was no Atlantic at this time. This is a really interesting period in the history of life on Earth, because it was the time when the land ecosystem was gradually becoming established. Life, of course, had originated in the water at a much earlier time. Um, but by sort of 400 million years ago, group after group of organisms, animals of various kinds, mostly early arthropods and so on, um, spiders, centipedes, this kind of thing, and early land plants were beginning to establish themselves on the land. And around the time represented by uh, the locality at Scat Craig, um, a group of fishes were also evolving into the first tetrapods or four-legged animals and starting to move onto land, their fins gradually transforming into forelimbs and hindlimbs. This is the story that this locality and Elgin Erpeton in particular illuminate. Okay, so um, here's uh, Patrick Duff's magnum opus, obviously covers a range of other topics, um, as you can get from the title, but quite a lot of it is about the excavations at Scat Craig, and he also figured a whole range of specimens um, that had been excavated there. Um, this book was published in 1842. Over time, though, you see, the, the, the fossils were all collected essentially by gentlemen amateurs, I guess, and they ended up over time being dispersed to a very wide range of museums, some in Scotland, but some also in England. Um, and then, because the material was, you know, rather fragmentary, small chunks of well, fish jaw here, some teeth here, much, much of the material looks like this, um, it didn't perhaps attract as much attention as it should have done, and from about the mid late 19th century and for the next 100 years or so, very little attention was paid to this stuff, although it remained secure in, in museum collections up and down the country. In the 1980s, uh, I was a PhD student at Cambridge working on Devonian vertebrates, especially a group of lobefin fishes. Um, and of course, I was traveling all over the place looking at museum collections. And as part of this, I became very interested in this strange material from Scat Craig. 
Um, and I ended up studying and describing material of a lobe fin fish, which you can see it's this same specimen here. This is, this is Patrick Duff's drawing of it. This is my drawing of it. 140 years later, it's still in reasonable condition. The specimen is in Edinburgh. Um, I was able to show that this is an entirely new kind of lobe fin fish, which I felt, well, what else could you call it? I gave it the name Duffichthys, of course, in, the, in honor of Patrick Duff. Um, you will meet the fictus, the fictus again towards the end of, of, of this little presentation, incidentally. Okay, so um, I'd become familiar with the material from Scat Craig. But something else had also happened, because in 1987, I was able to accompany my PhD supervisor, Jennifer Clack, that's her there, and that's me in the questionable hat, together with two colleagues from Denmark, um, uh, accompanied her on, a, on an expedition to Greenland, specifically looked for remains of some of the earliest tetrapods, in particular this animal, Acanthus tiger, of which we found some really lovely material. This is in fact one of the specimens that we collected. Um, the material is so good that it's possible to piece together a complete reconstruction of Acanthus tiger, as you see here. Now the point with this, apart from it being a you know, wonderful trip, was the fact that it gave me an awful lot of hands-on experience at recognizing Devonian tetrapods and distinguishing them from the often quite similar lobefin fishes of this period, even from small fragments. Because we spent day after day scouring the hillsides, looking for bits and bobs, going, oh, well, what would this be? Ah, this time we found a piece of tetrapod, or no, this time it's a fish. So having that knowledge, as it were, at the back of my head, I was able shortly afterwards to, to discover um, while going through material from Scab Craig, really looking for interesting lobefin fish, that, you know, goodness me, this material actually contains a tetrapod as well. And I described this material in a series of papers, the first two in, in Nature, which, as you may know, is a very high profile journal and says something about the significance of the discovery, and then uh, another paper in, in Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. The big deal with this was not only that it was the first Devonian tetrapod from Scotland, or indeed from the British Isles, full stop, but also that it was, and in fact still remains to this day, the earliest tetrapod known from anywhere in the world from body fossils, in other words, from bones. There are some even earlier fragments that possibly could be tetrapod, but they are very difficult to interpret and, you know, the, very much debated whether they're really tetrapod or not. With Elginerpton, it's absolutely clear cut. This is a tetrapod, and at present, it still holds the record of being the earliest in the world. We have a fair amount of it, but there's also a fair amount missing. In this reconstruction, you can see that basically what we have in black is bits that we actually have. Now, some of the major specimens are, are, are identified here by number, but we also have more pieces. For example, we have not just one shoulder girdle, but I think four in total, all showing approximately the same bit. Um, it's been possible to piece together the entire lower jaw and then part of the snout and bits of the limb girdles and a wee bit of the hind limb. And then everything that you see here in pale grey, we haven't got at all. So you might think, on, you know, on what basis can you possibly infer what it looked like then? Well, it's simply based on, on in this instance, a canthostega, but more generally, all the really early tetrapods that we have decent fossil material of, all looks kind of ballpark like this, and so we can be pretty confident that Elginopeton at least did not look wildly different from this. It's a sort of crocodile-shaped animal in general, but you can notice a few odd things. These little lines of dots that you see on the head here are lateral line canals. They're sensory organs that fishes have. They work only in water. Uh, you have eight toes on the limbs. This is a particular thing with Acanthus tiger. Whether Elginopeton was like that, we don't know. Um, Acanthus tiger also has a great big tail fin, and not just like some sort of flap that you might find in a you know, crocodile or something, but uh, an actual fish-like tail fin. One point to note is that Elginopton is a very much larger animal, uh, maybe pushing two meters in length, whereas a is more on the lines of like 70 centimeters. And of course it lived a good deal earlier, about 15 million years earlier, in fact. We can say a fair bit about its diet. It was very obviously a predator because you've got these sharp pointed 
teeth for, for catching prey. Definitely not a, not a plant eater. Um, the fact that there are really rather a lot of these teeth and that they are quite small suggest that the animal was a fish eater um, rather than a, a predator on, on large prey. Interestingly, although it does look very water adapted, it's got lateral line canals on the jaw and so forth. And the whole you know, shape of the thing suggests a, a, a fish eating, perhaps somewhat crocodile-like critter. Um, it's clear that it could move on land. And I say that because the, the shoulder girdle and the pelvis are both quite big, they're quite robust. And I mean, look, you know, this, these are scraps and they kind of look like nothing, you'll have to take my word for it. But what you have here is a really characteristic um, or a small fragment of a really characteristic tetrapod shoulder girdle. And again, a tetrapod pelvis of the kind that's actually attached to the backbone and can support the body, much as you see here in Acanthus tiger. Uh, a fish pelvis wouldn't look like, look like this at all. It's a much smaller affair and just kind of lies in the body wall. It's just something to, to hang a pair of fins on really. So this really tells us that although this is probably very, very much aquatic animal, it will have had the capacity to move over land as well. One interesting thing about it is the shape of the snout, the, the, the tip of the nose. Here's one of the bones from that region, this bone called the premaxilla, it's the same one that we've got in the front of our upper jaw. Um, and here's a, another fragment of sort of back part of the premaxilla. They add up to this narrow pointed shape that you see here, which is very unlike what you get in most of the early tetrapods where that same assembly of bones tends to be much broader like this. Oops, sorry. Um, and that of course tells us something about the shape of the entire head because the shape of the tip of the snout really constrains that. Other early tetrapods, this is a Canthostega, and here we have another couple of related Devonian forms. They all have these rather broad heads that well, they look rather like toilet seat lids. It's a sort of standard shape for these guys. Um, Elginerpeton was clearly quite different. It's a much bigger animal, as you see indicated here, but also you have a rather different, much more triangular head shape. So this is suggesting a degree of ecological diversification. These animals are not all doing quite the same thing. That yellowish sandstone that the fossils come out of seems to represent a large river running through a fairly arid landscape. Uh, and we find not just bones of Elginerpidon in there, but bones of a whole range of different fish. Um, this reconstruction is actually not that river at all. What it shows is a coastal lagoon in Russia from a very slightly later time. This is kind of the next tetrapod we have in the fossil record after Elginerpeton. Um, it's a thing called Parmastiga. I described it with colleagues a couple of years ago, uh, and it's a little bit more complete. So we get a better idea of what the whole animal looked like, but Elginerpeton is probably pretty similar in, in, in outline to this. And here are some of the other fish that it cohabited with. You can imagine this perhaps being something rather like the Elginerpeton environment. And here's an interesting thing. The fish fauna of these two places is really very similar. It's not just like, like you know, yeah, okay, the late Devonian fish in both localities is very much exactly the same fish. And in particular, very surprisingly, this is the only other place in the world where you get that lobefin fish, Duffichthys, that I described all those years ago. Um, so there's something very similar, perhaps related about these two faunas, which is, which is decidedly interesting, but we shall have to pursue some other time. Okay, was Elginerpeton then the very first tetrapod? Does it show us, you know, the origin of tetrapods in real time? No, no, it doesn't. Sadly, I suppose one might say. And how do we know that? Well, we know it because there are fossil footprints of tetrapods that are even older. The very oldest come from uh, a site in Poland called Zahelmie. They are perhaps 15 million years older than um, Elginerpeton. Then from Ireland, we have these from Valencia Island. There are in fact many more tracks from Valencia Island, uh, but this is just one of the nicer ones. We can see very nicely how the animal has been walking along here. These perhaps 10 million years younger, or 10 million years older, sorry, than um, Elginerpeton. And here, slightly younger again, 
uh, a very nice tetrapod track from Australia from a locality called Genoa River. So these animals seem to be kind of widely distributed during this period, slightly before Elgin Erpton appears on the scene. But interestingly, you know, we got these, and oh, that's lovely. And then we have them at Castle Haven on Tarbot Ness, just, just across the Moray Firth. Um, these have been described in the literature, but have never been studied in any great detail. And once, uh, you know, the whole pandemic situation is properly under control and I'm traveling again, it's a priority of mine to go and have a proper look at these for the first time myself. Um, it's a really interesting locality, um, probably a little bit older than Scat Craig. One might guess about the same age as those Australian tracks, uh, but at any rate, a very, very interesting discovery that, that deserves more attention than it has been than it has received so far. So, all right, just to summarise then. What is the importance of Elgin Erpton? Well, it is still, to this day, the earliest tetrapod in the world that's represented by decent body fossils. We can say a little bit more than just it exists and actually say a little bit about it as an animal. And it's very distinctive. It's really large and it has a, an unusual head shape for a Devonian tetrapod, pointing to a specialized ecology. And when you put it in the comparative context with these other forms that you saw briefly earlier on, you know, those different head shapes and all, beginning perhaps to give us some sort of idea of ecological diversification right at this very beginning of tetrapod evolution. And together with the Tarbot nest tracks, Elgin Erpton really highlights the importance of the Murray Firth area as one of the most significant locations in the world for understanding this extremely important evolutionary event that forms part of our own distant ancestry, the origin of tetrapods. Thank you very much.